Mike Akuda and Denise Akuda are longtime members of the Star Trek art department from Star Trek The Next Generation all the way through to Star Trek Enterprise. Mike Akuda is a three-time Emmy nominee for Outstanding Visual Effects. They are both, <laughs> hang on, <laughs> God, they, they, are, they are deep with Star Trek. They were consultants on the CBS remastered versions of the original series and The Next Generation. And uh, for those of you who have gotten to see the versions of the original series with the, the new visual effects, uh, bravo, those, those are amazing. Uh, they are advisors on the newly announced Gene Roddenberry Archive Project. They are the authors of the Star Trek Encyclopedia, which, by the way, weighs about 300 pounds. <laughs> they are producers on the Roddenberry Vault, which came out five years ago and is a holy grail. And we'll talk about that vault in a moment. And Mike Akuda currently is the graphic designer for Star Trek Picard. And both Mike Akuda and Denise Akuda are my very good friends. So please welcome to the stage Michael Akuda and Denise Akuda. Yay! Give it up! <laughs> Give it up, ladies and gentlemen, for Mike and Denise. Yes! <laughs> and give it up for Scott. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> all right, so, so, like, listen, first of all, I, I, I want to start, Mike, with you. Like, why is City on the Edge Forever as great as everyone says it is? You know, I had the same feeling. How many times have we seen this over and over and over again? What a treat it is to see it projected as well. I mean, just, I mean, we know the dialogue, we know the music, we know everything, and yet it gets to us, it gets to me every single time. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing. You know, when, uh, th there's a lot of reasons why Star Trek is so special. One of the reasons is from the very beginning, Gene Roddenberry reached out not just to experienced television writers, but he's deliberately sought out uh, accomplished science fiction writers, Sam Peebles, um, uh, George Clayton Johnson, um, uh, Richard Matheson, uh, Ted Sturgeon, Robert Block, Jerome Bixby, and the great Harlan Ellison. And to Roddenberry's considerable credit, he, uh, Ellison, if you probably, uh, if you know Harlan Ellison, he was legendarily difficult to work with. <laughs> and the, uh, the results on the screen sh uh, show is utterly worth it, but Roddenberry reached out. Roddenberry kept uh, kept trying to bring this to the screen. This was supposed to have been one of the early episodes made for this uh, for the first season. In fact, it ended up being the uh, the second to the last. But they made it happen, and it was it was because uh, one of that reasons is that Roddenberry so valued the vision and the imagination and the thought process of uh, accomplished science fiction writers. You know, one of the things about, about the, the original series, there, there's a, a fab four, if you will, to the original series. Of course, that's Gene Roddenberry, Gene Kuhn, uh, Dorothy Fontana, and Bob Justman. And, and all of them, really, Denise, they all had a part in this episode. This is really everybody bringing their strengths to this episode. And, but what were some of the interesting things about the original Harwin Ellison story that were very different from the version that we saw? Oh, it was completely different, almost. I mean, really, I mean, this went through many different filters of people that you mentioned that, that knew Star Trek and also to bring it to the screen for television. Um, the original Harlan Ellison story has to do with drug dealing and, and so forth that just didn't really fit into the Star Trek universe. Um, and I think what we see on the screen is, is uh, timeless. I mean, this was made many, many years ago, and yet it resonates today. You know, the thing that most people probably know, but the, the quintessential, like, big difference between Harlan Ellison's version and the version we saw is that Harlan Ellison's version, you probably already know this because you're here, but Kirk goes to save Edith, and Spock stops Kirk. The change was made for McCoy to say, or to try to save Edith, and Kirk stops him. Why, 
Mike, is that such a fundamental and, and a, the right change made for the character of Kirk? How would, how would people have felt about Jim Kirk if he motioned to save Edith? Clearly you want, you want James Kirk to be our hero. You want him to, to be the one to make that fundamental change. Ellison's loyalty was to his, his, his story and perhaps that would have been a more, a more dramatic version to make. But the best version for Star Trek was, uh, was, was the aired version. And, uh, and I think that's, that's at the core of, of the difficulties between Roddenberry and, and, and Ellison. Uh, Ellison had a very clear, very powerful, very poignant vision uh, but Roddenberry had an understanding of where he wanted Star Trek to go. And even though it's very obvious to all of us now what Star Trek is, back then in the first season, especially early in the first season, it wasn't at all, at all that obvious. It, uh, uh, it, the, the Star Trek format was something that they were, they were still feeling their, their way toward. And to ask uh, an accomplished science fiction writer to, to come up with something, he's going he's gonna to come up with his own stuff, and it's, and it's going to be good but it may not necessarily be, be Star Trek. So you need someone like the show's creator to guide it. So what, one, of the, one of the ways in which the mood and the look of Star Trek became very effective, I, I don't think this uh, gentleman gets enough credit, but I'm sure a lot of you in this room, and certainly both of you, will agree that the director of photography, cinematographer, Jerry Finneman. Gerald Perry Finneman. Denise, I wonder if you could talk about just, just the, his work on the original series and just how, how unique it is, because no other show before had looked like this. And, well, with the exception of maybe uh, uh, In a Mirror Darkly and Trials and Tribulations, no other show has looked like it since. It was groundbreaking. And you have to remember, in the Wayback Machine, you know, black and white TV was the norm and color was not. And yet, um, you watch, you, you look at the, the, the lighting on the original series and these splashes of vibrant colors um, that was just a different look. You just didn't see it in, in television in the 1960s. Um, uh, we had the, the, the pleasure of, of, of uh, meeting um, um, uh, Jerry Finnerman on Deep, on Deep Space, Space Nine. Nine. And um, not only did we talk a little bit about the original series, but he also was very endearing that he loved his little dogs. And so we talked about dogs and Star Trek. And uh, <laughs> it's very nice. So, so, uh, so five years ago, a Blu-ray uh, DVD set came out called The Roddenberry Vault. How many of you have this? Okay, for those of you who don't, you're missing out. And here's why. It is the holy grail for fans of Star Trek, because for the first time in 50 years, we got to see deleted scenes, alternate takes, extended takes from the original show that had been literally locked in a vault for 50 years. And the reason I bring this up is because there was one scene in particular that came from City on the Edge of Forever that they had to cut for time, and, and when you watch it on the vault, it does, it, it, it is a revelation, isn't it? What, what was the scene? Well, there were several, but the one that I'm thinking about is um, when Kirk and Edith are on the stairs, and um, I don't remember the exact dialogue, I'm sure you do, yeah. um, about being forever. Uh -huh. uh, right. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, Kirk says, uh, to, or excuse me, Edith says to Kirk, uh, wait for me. Oh, yeah, wait for me, and he says forever. So, so it's the scene where... where uh, Edith tells Kirk, uh, you know, we're, we speak the same language, and Kirk says we're very the same. So that scene continues, and, and, and we actually see Kirk and Edith actually kiss, because you don't see them kiss in the episode here. But uh, it is, it is like, like the first time I saw it, which in the presence of Mike and Denise, my jaw hit the floor and I was in tears because it was such a, such a crucial, crucial moment. But uh, the, the, the thing about the end of this episode is the final words, let's get the hell out of here. That was the first time that a uh, profanity was used uh, as an expletive in, in Star Trek. And, and wh why was that so important for that moment, that, that they had to fight to actually use that word in that last line? Mike? This was, pr uh, 
Kirk legitimately and unfortunately has a reputation of, of being a womanizer. And in the 21st century, we could look back and go, well, that was not entirely appropriate. But this, this was Kirk's greatest romance. This is, uh, this is the most important relationship he had. And for him to lose that motivated for him to say, let's get the hell out of here. And it's, it was shocking. I mean, it was shocking because you just didn't hear that language on television back then. And it, that's why it just meant so, I mean, it was just, let's get the hell out of here. Um, yeah, and, and, and the look on Shatner's face that, yeah. that, that just, I've been through hell. Yeah. Uh, uh, by the way, that, that moment, uh, at the end of the, when, when Kirk and Spock and McCoy jump back through the Guardian. So Scotty's like, wow, you just left. And Uhura is like, hey, the Enterprise is up there. Like, everybody's happy to see them. They're back. We're, you know, the Enterprise is back. History is restored. Way to go, fellas. But they, the look on Kirk's face, you know, Kirk isn't making eye contact with anybody. And Scotty and Uhura, their smiles start to fade, and they realize that something is wrong. And it, it, it's, it's just such, a, it's such a, a great moment. And as far as using the, uh, uh, the word hell, uh, director Joseph Pevney uh, had this to say uh, uh, a few years ago. He said, and I quote, using hell in that last line was something of a problem. There were objections from the network. Roddenberry had a meeting with them and said, there is no other word that conveys the emotion of that moment. And of course, William Shatner fought for it too. We all wanted it because it sounded great. Finally, NBC said, what the hell, leave it in. <laughs> but Mike, you know, and Denise, after, after Star Trek touched your lives in, in the way that it did, you know, getting to meet Roddenberry and work with him on The Next Generation, I mean, what was that, like, what a, talk about a dream come true. What was that like for you? Yeah, that's one of the things I say to Mike all the time. You want to know something? All of my dreams have come true. And meeting and working with Gene Roddenberry was one of them. I mean, I grew up, you know, worshiping the man, and then as I became an adult, um, knowing that I was working with this legendary person, but that he was human, too. Um, we are just so fortunate to have worked with him and have such great memories. Uh, a lot of the uh, more negative stories you hear about Roddenberry I think are motivated by the fact that when you're in a, in a position of success as he is, your uh, people all around you are, um, uh, they're, they're always trying to get something out of you. And you see that in a lot of successful people there, no matter how nice they are, they, they, have, they have their defenses up. And uh, during the first season of Star Trek The Next Generation, I, I could absolutely see that. He was, he was an affable, nice guy, but you could see his, he was, he was always a half second from turning his shields on. But at the same time, I think he understood that there were pe people around him, uh, a lot of us on staff, uh, who genuinely loved him, who were genuinely there to support him. So I remember during the first season of Next Generation, he was notoriously hard, hard, to, hard to please. Uh, he would reject a lot of stuff. And yet, most of the stuff that I, that I sent up to his office, most of the suggestions, even random things that had nothing to do with graphics, uh, he, he, would, he would be appreciative. He'd, uh, I made a suggestion for one of the scripts. He called me up and, uh, in my office and said, this is a good idea, let's do that. Oh, wow, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> they, they didn't end up doing it, but... Uh, <laughs> But, to, but I got a call from Gene Roddenberry saying thank you. <laughs> uh, Lester, if you've got questions, you know, please uh, come up and, uh, and ask away at the mics. But, to, but like, you know, when you're watching Star Trek and you just are, are taken with the stories and the metaphors and the messages, especially because I... Uh, but like, what was like one of the first episodes that you got to work on where you went, oh, okay, I see what's going on here. You know, like, do, you, do you have like a, uh, like a vivid recollection, a memory of like, Oh, this, this is going to be really, really, really special, really good. The early days of Next Generation were... were the show had not yet found its legs. Yeah. And uh, I honestly didn't think the show would last. But at the same time, I'm going, I'm getting to work on Star Trek. I'm getting to work for Gene Roddenberry. You better savor this. And so 
every day I'd go to work and say, I'm getting, I'm getting, to, I'm getting to work in Star Trek. I think we were very, very blessed through the different incarnations of Star Trek that we worked on, that we felt like we were working with a family, and um, that meant a lot. And, and the amount of time that you spend at the studio, as opposed to in your own home, you spend much more time at work. So it's always very nice um, to work with a great bunch of people. And in the art departments, we happen to work with people that love Star Trek as much as we did, especially in the graphics department. Yeah. Let, let, me, uh, let me add that uh, we, Denise and I grew up with the original Star Trek. That, that's, that's our favorite show. We, we're very proud of everything else we've worked on, but that's the one we, we grew up with, even though we didn't, even though we didn't work on it. And as you, as you work, when you work in television, as, as you know, uh, you, you don't get everything you want. You're, it's, it's, not, it's not always wonderful. And, and, some, some, and sometimes it's, it's a lot of pressure. Sometimes it's like, eh, this isn't really gonna be as good as I'd like it to be. But one of the things that for both of us, we understood uh, and we hoped that there are kids out there uh, who, to whom whatever ha we're working on at that moment, that will be as special to them as the original Star Trek was for us. So we would always say, we're not working for Paramount, we're not working for CBS, we're working for that 12-year-old out there. And when, when things got dicey, that's something that carried us through. And by the way, I just gotta say, uh, you did work on the original series, because you have 80 episodes of TOS that were remastered with beautiful new special effects that I think are just absolutely fantastic. And just to show you the detail, give you an idea of the detail, why Mike and Denise you know, Dave Rossi were, were the perfect people to work on, the, on the, the, the newer versions of the original series. If you notice at the end, during the, uh, the last credits of Sitting on the Edge of Forever, when it says, directed by Joseph Pevney, written by Harlan Ellison, executive producer Gene Roddenberry, the, the fog coming out <laughs> of The Guardian freezes. But in the remastered version, the fog coming out of The Guardian keeps going. It flows seamlessly. Whose idea was that? In the production meeting, they looked at me like, what are you, nuts? <laughs> That's why you were the right people to do this. <laughs> but, but, but also, there was another like, a total geek out moment when I was watching Gamesters of Triskelion, because in the teaser, Kirk says, oh, that's a trinary sun. So you, know, you have the opening credits, uh, and then you come back for act one, it says Gamesters of Triskelion, and you see that it is a trinary sun. I'm like, oh my God, these guys are awesome. That All was right, Dave Rossi's question. idea, by the way. <laughs> See? <laughs> well, uh, first, I say thank you. I was that 12-year-old. I, I had your uh, encyclopedia on CD-ROM, and that was my gateway in a time before streaming and DVD when you really couldn't see everything. That, that was my gateway into all of Star Trek. But I wanted to ask you, uh, on Star Trek, or really anything you work on, what is your first rule or philosophy or sort of building block when it comes to design? What's, what's the most important thing for you? I wouldn't say there's a single rule, but uh, you're always trying to find that sweet spot. What's, uh, what's artistically valid? What tells the story? Uh, uh, and, and what's practical from the point, uh, point of view of, of, of time and, and money? You have to find the sweet spot, because if you go for one thing and, and you ignore the others, you've not done your job. What he said, and, <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think simplicity of design and um, also, I think Michael came up with a philosophy that carried through, and I think it really worked. You pick a look, actually, Matt Jeffries in the original series, you pick a look, you stick with it, and it becomes real. And I think that's really, really, I think it works. Yeah, if you look at the original Enterprise, look at, look at the control panels, they have, they have kind of a goofy style. But if you look at, the, at them, they're, uh, I mean, they're, they're arbitrary. They're, they happen to be what Matt could afford. But because he stuck with it, because he was consistent with it, because the actors took it seriously, because the directors took it seriously, because Matt took it seriously, you take it seriously, and I take it seriously, and it still works 55 years later. Thank you. Yeah, so hands off Matt to Matt Jeffries. Jeffries. Last question right here. Hey, Mike. Hey, Denise. Uh, first of all, thank you for developing so much of the graphic language of Star Trek that all of us enjoy. Uh, I wanted to know, with everything you've done, how much fun was it to do the uh, master display system for the Cerritos? 
He's, he's referring to the, uh, start, the uh, uh, CBS Paramount animated series Star Trek Lower Decks. Uh, we were at in Las Vegas at uh, um, at the Star Trek convention, and this this, this guy uh, runs up to me and says, "Hey, Mike!" And I never never met the guy before. It's Michael McMahon, the g guy who created Star Trek Lower Decks, <laughs> and uh, uh, we exchange business cards. He invites us up to uh, to Nickelodeon to, uh, to to look at the shows be before they were aired, and you know, and and they're a lot of fun. Uh, some time later, he calls up and says, or actually uh, emails us and says, "Would you uh, um, would you do a, a ship cutaway?" And I said, "I'm sure it's a lot of fun to do." So, yeah, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> it was uh, it was especially fun because I could say I could think of goofy things, and I'd email uh, uh, Michael and, and and his staff and say, "What if we put in this?" And they go, "Great." <laughs> by, by the way, I have to say. Have, have you all seen Lower Decks? Yeah. <laughs> Lower Decks is, is terrific. It's, it's my favorite of the newer shows. And season two, which just wrapped, uh, is you can, tell, you can tell that Michael and, and everyone on that show, that they love Star Trek and they understand it. It's its own thing. Uh, I'm not sure if it's canon, but it's still a lot of fun, ladies and gentlemen. Give it up for Michael Akuda and Denise Akuda. Thank you so, Thank you. so much.